Mr. Liam. Mr. Frazier. Here. Mr. Bertiassi. Here. Ms. Jordan. Here. Some members present. Thank you. Okay, we've got three items on our agenda. The four our regular meeting at 7 o'clock. And the first is the proposal for uninterrupted power supply. And is that going to be you, Laverne? Yes. Can you start off, Mr. Vaughn? Uh, yes, Madam President, I'd like to have Laverne Walker, our information technology expert, to speak to the uninterrupted uh, on 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 power supply. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. This item should be pretty painless. It's for uninterruptible power supplies at our remote location, pretty much a UPS or an uninterrupted power supply, the piece of hardware equipment is used to go in between electrical power and equipment. In the event that there's a brownout or a complete blackout, it gives the equipment power, continuous power. Um, ironically, today, we have one of them fail upstairs in the mayor's office and administration. They called us, everything was out. As you know, there's wind outside, a lot of electricity is out today. So we did have one fail, but all the other ones stayed up. Um, as you can see from the letter, they are out of warranty. Uh, we cannot extend the warranty. They are starting to fail. And um, this one for a not to exceed amount of $75,000. This fiscal year, the impact is $35,000. Next fiscal year, 2014-15, is $40,000. We did do a bid, and the bid results are on your last page. Three companies did respond. Microwise of Southfield, Michigan is the lowest at $73,507. We do have um, extended batteries at some locations because we need more run time. For example, if power does go out, some locations need to stay up running longer than 15 or 20 minutes, so we have extended batteries, and that is estimated at $10,000 for those locations. I think we have one question. Yeah, on the, um that's uh, 40000 that's coming out of the next year's budget? That is correct. Yes. Uh, how, how come we're taking money out of next year's budget and we haven't approved it yet? Well, it says per, that council may approve, but it is budget and allocated. Because it's over 20 locations, it's too difficult for me to do them all at one time. I'm trying to stagnate the process and do so many this fiscal year before July 1st, before uh, June 30th, rather, and I'm going to do the rest of the locations after July 1st. Now, I understand that, but if you're approving money <coughs> out of the next budget, then the budget isn't been approved yet. We, we will be re recommended. Mm -hmm. Well, if council did not approve the budget with yeah. that in it, then this couldn't happen. Yeah, yeah, I just wonder, you know, what's the No, she hasn't bought it yet. No, I have not. You would not buy it until the new... Uh, correct. I would only buy a, a 35000 for this. It's actually 5000 professional services and $30,000. And if the debt came in at $73,000, uh, why wouldn't it just say uh, that the uh, low bidder uh, be so and so at the at the price of seventy two thousand as opposed to not to see seventy five thousand? If the bid is is a firm bid, then it's seventy three thousand dollars. That is a good question, and the reason I I decided to do that because with these UPSs you don't know I may get a location where I may need another battery. So because it's just a guesstimate at this point, we're trying to replace exactly what we have, but we want to improve upon in some areas. So if I get to each area that needs more runtime, I would do that. But we could do it at 73000 That was my choice to do 75000 since it was so close. It was a not to exceed. So it may come in at 70000 after I look at it. Uh, you're bidding on the specs. It's hardware and professional specs. services, correct. And so the specs have to be the specs. We can't give you some of what you're bidding on. Otherwise, somebody else who's bidding says, hey, uh, you know, it's 73000 but they're giving it for seventy five. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly that. okay with saying not to exceed a $73,577 if, if that's more comfortable for you. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm expecting like something lower. When something is bid, it's bid for a price. And that, and that bid is what it is. And, and the seventy-five thousand gives you latitude to go <coughs> over over the seventy-two thousand. Right, it would be a contingency, but I'm I'm perfectly comfortable that I'll come in under seventy-three thousand. So I'm comfortable with that. With that. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to see that that the low low bid of uh, 
Michael Wise of Southfield be awarded the, the, the bid at $73,570. I would be okay with that. Mr. Frazier. Yeah, um, can your equipment stand any kind of a power interruption? Any kind? If, if you have a power failure, is, is your equipment so sensitive? For instance, like a TV set, the minute there's a, or the second there's a power interruption, it'll drop off. Oh, no, it won't drop off. That's what it's for, for uninterrupted. I understand that, but that's not the question I asked. The question I ask is, can your equipment stand a power interruption? Not without the UPS. And my, then my question is, what kind of a switch is there? Are you familiar with it? With the UPS? Yeah. Yes. Okay. What kind of a switch is there that, um, that won't allow any kind of a power interruption? Well, there are batteries inside of the UPS. So the batteries are when it's plugged. The batteries are always monitoring the, the power? Yes, it is. And actually, my cell phone, if there's any power outage at Fire Station 1 headquarters, I get an alert on my cell phone. So I even know when it flickers, I get an email alert to my cell phone. But there are batteries, and when it's plugged into the wall, the UPSs are constantly charging. So as soon as the power goes out, the batteries kick in automatically. That's the way it's designed. So the batteries are, are monitoring the, the power itself. So when it's either a surge or a, an interruption comes in, it, it flows with the batteries rather than. Correct. And they'll okay. tell me on my cell phone how much runtime I have left. Like if I have 15 minutes or 20 minutes left, and they'll, okay. keep, they'll right. keep alerting me. Right. Because I know if there's any kind of switch, even the fastest <coughs> switch can't. Oh, right. Can't switch fast enough, you know, to keep up um, power interruptions. Okay, thanks. Right, Mr. Mann? Yeah, I have a general question on bidding for generation. Many, many years we have made the bid to the lowest bidder, hoping he's better than the ones that charge more money, a bit higher. Sometimes, many a time, that's not true. We have a lesson that nobody seems to remember. So we did for the asphalt and the subdivision on the Red Lake Plain in that area, within, when, when Don Gross was the administrator, within three months, everything stood up in the air. All the pavement, all the, the asphalt, everything, it was bad. And that was cheap. Got the lowest bid. So sometimes when you bid low, you get low. How do, how do we check, how do we know? Theoretically, and supposed to be actually, the only people that are allowed to bid are the ones that meet our requirements. They can meet the requirements, yeah. When they put it in, well, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> if the lesson over there was. Yeah. Maybe the inspector was on the, well, wasn't on the job. Mm -hmm. So, so the chair. we can't allow that. We have to know that. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. Who the, who the better company is here, 75000 or 73000 Through the chair to come. We're just looking at the cost. Ms. Ward wanted to jump in. Just that we don't, we are not obligated by the, the ordinances to accept the lowest bid. We accept the lowest responsible bid. And so every bid that comes in, there is an evaluation process on whether this is a responsible bid, not just whether it's a low bid. So they look at references. I mean, that's what our purchasing department does. They check references. They find out, is this company capable of performing the work that, that we've set out in the specifications? And if they're not, you know, we have bypassed low bids before to take the next bidder because for some reason there's been some kind of an evaluation that the, the low bid is not capable of performing the work. That's the purchasing department. Purchasing. That's that well, they wouldn't know. Well no, they were they do it with the with the using department. So if it was for example a tech item, then there would be an evaluation with the tech director and the purchasing department to make sure that if the low bid is the low bid, is that now a responsible bid? And and so that does occur. They, that does occur. Yeah, we've had I we've had things that were said that <coughs> six people six people submitted bids. Only four qualified. Yeah, absolutely. Or they, you know, jumped over the lowest bidder yeah. because they they were determined not to be responsible. So. Right, I'm we bringing up a point. The condition our roads are in now, they're all bid. Right. They went, they went to hell. 
It became Holy, <coughs> holy Southfield. That will probably have all been. Look like um, it. Uh, I don't know. I'm just bringing up the mm -hmm. subject then. Okay. Well, as as our attorney says that if they don't, they have to be responsible. They are, well, not only the lower they are the board and they're all responsible. They're saying they're all responsible. Well, we we verify that. I mean, we mm -hmm. don't just accept them indicating. I'm not we got all the trouble. With. Well, I think roads are a whole different issue. I mean, I think we've had some issues with inspection. Yeah, uh, materials, the yeah, materials, the right. inspections, right. 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 other factors in this. Uh, well, I, I said it was the Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Thank you. I think you might. Well, I just want to they have requirements when they go in. I mean, these people are our technical people, our department. There's certain requirements before you, it's just not are they responsible, are they qualified? Mm -hmm. So they have to meet certain qualifications before they're even allowed to bid, and they have to show that they meet those qualifications. And it's truly Do you see all that? <coughs> Do you yeah. see the record of these people that we give the bid to? Well, that's not what I can explain to sure. you. Okay. These particular um, companies that bid, they're not selling us their UPSs. We are buying APC UPSs. So they all bid on the same specification. So they are resellers for APC. So APC is an industry standard maker for uninterruptible power supply. So where the cost differs is in the cost of the hardware because they have different tiers with for to be a reseller. And it, it also includes their freight cost, their five year warranty, and their professional services. So at that point their prices fluctuate. But yes we did evaluate all of that. But as far as the hardware itself, as far as being low bid, um, they they were specking out the same hardware as ATC. It's not microwise, it's not computer and environment. They're resellers of this company that we're purchasing the hardware from.
Uh, this item was reviewed also by the Finance Committee at length. Uh, we'll present that uh, presentation on all of the ratings, uh, but we're preparing to make a recommendation as to um, what level of investment needs to be made in our roads to keep them in good shape. And that number uh, is between an additional four to six million dollars. This particular 4.2 million uh, will be used for road projects that are in the uh, planning stage right now uh, or out for contract. Greenfield, eight to nine mile, Evergreen uh, Road, eight to nine mile, 11 mile, 2,300 feet just east of Inkster. Uh, northwest, uh, uh, the other would be Evergreen, uh, 12 to 13. I have a list of road projects that we have funded. What's the amount of those that you have listing? Yeah. What's the amount of the Oh, uh, the total uh, project cost of everything on this. So this includes uh, some projects in future years. 27 million total project cost. With the feds picking up 16 uh, million 177 thousand, city's uh, total cost is 10 million 830 thousand. Uh, part of the uh, cost are uh, water and sewer projects, 5 million, uh, 5.6 million. Total cost of roads, city roads is uh, just under 5 million. We have tri-party funding coming at Greenfield with Oakland County, the Oakland County Road Commission for 324 thousand. Our DDA is putting 100,000 in on Greenfield, eight to nine mile, and then our city center board is putting 100,000 in Evergreen Road, uh, Northwestern to 11 mile. Maybe just pass these out. This was a list of projects set to our bond council last week. Um, but the one scheduled for the next fiscal year, the first one, second. Third project, fourth project. Can we add again? Third the now? first four are scheduled uh, and they are part of next year's budget. Okay. Uh, the first four? First four. And the, the sixth project, Nine Mile Beach to Telegraph. All of those projects will be happening uh, starting the next fiscal year. Uh, the other, so uh, just this morning they have a, had a conversation about northbound, northwestern, eight to nine mile, about what would we, the commitment for that project from the feds is for next year, about possibly moving that forward with the city fronting the cash, uh, just, just exploring if that road is in such bad condition. Craters. I mean, yes. That's, that's yeah. horrible. But you're going to see when you go through this pacer evaluation, unfortunately, for these roads to score, they almost have to be in crater-like condition. It's got to be the number it's one. Uh, somewhat uh, concerning, uh, very much concerning, I should say. Uh, but in the budget, we were planning, the recommendation was to take the, uh, we, we when the budget was put together, we were short four and a half million, and you'll see this in, in the PowerPoint that's being put together for May 5th. We're taking a three-year look back on major and local roads, and then we're trying to project where we're going into the future. Um, the budget had 4.4 million coming in for major local roads that had to be filled <coughs> from money outside. Well, the one was one source was to transfer a million from local roads to major that left us 3.5 and the original budget we were just planning on either the city's economic development fund the 6 million or from the LERV which currently has a balance of about 6.5 million after the sale of the Ramada end building we'll have 8.5 million right. I don't tomorrow. want to change it with yeah, hopefully closing tomorrow uh, but we were going to plan on taking that money from either LERV or economic development when the opportunity came up to refinance these bonds and also carry our annual savings about 240000 a year. That was the total savings. Total. total. There's this, what, what was the annual savings? I'm sorry. There's a, an annual savings. Uh, but this additional $4.2 million is what we'll use to fill this year's budget instead of borrowing either from our economic development fund or our uh, LERF. We will use these funds 
to fill that gap. Uh, how, uh, how, uh, how much is this, this bond being paid out of my account? It is being paid out of major roads yeah. uh, on an annualized basis uh, at a lesser interest rate than we're paying today. But I thought a major road fund was pretty well gone. Well, your major road fund is already incurring this debt. Mm -hmm. So you're going to extend the same level of debt and um, move that forward. $45,000 a year approximately. So there's, we're going to be saving 45000 a year in savings, and we'll continue to have the same level of debt service at, ma at major. But we are, you are correct, we are extending that. Uh, we're 10 years into a 15-year bond, have five years left, so we're going to extend that for another 15 years, or an additional 10 years. So, um, you know, the reality is, is money is still very cheap. This is, is a good opportunity to take care of this. On the 5th, you're going to see an extensive discussion about water and sewer and leveraging those funds to make improvements to our, our roads. Uh, and that's where, where we do have some, some substantial assets uh, that could be better leveraged to help us upgrade some of our residential streets as well. Municipal bonds <coughs> are still being looked at quite uh, under the microscope. Uh, Steve, can I ask Steve a question? Sure. Uh, what's the bond market look like for municipalities? Um, Terry may be able to comment oh, too on, on kind of the, the economics of, of that. Oh, I can oh, oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah, if you want to go first, Terry. Do you want me to go to The bond market is still looking favorable, especially at this short of uh, term, uh, because there's only you know, roughly five years out, seeing five or six years on the bonds that are being refinanced. And we're looking at a shorter term for the new money portion of the issue. So, um, and the interest rate, depending on what structure you use, you know, we've been running it at a couple different structuring options where the new money could be wrapped around existing debt so that, you know, I think your, your point was, you know, you don't want too much in payments in the early years, so you're putting most of the payments on the new money at the, at the end, and, or you could just do level payments on the new money, keep the payments on the refunding portion the same as they are, although it be 45000 roughly less than they are right now, and just running that, with 1.67% on the, the refunding piece of it. So just giving you an idea of, you know, what rates we were looking at for the, the, the refunding. If we go through for an additional bond issue in November, council closed that route. Does this put a strain on that uh, ability for us to sell another bond? Um, the one thing, the $10 million, and I think you brought it up earlier, the, the the reason we came up with the magical $10 million number is that the city is eligible so long as it's financing within the calendar year, $10 million or less, to qualify for what we call bank qualified um, interest yeah. rates or bonds. And it gives these financial institutions an additional incentive to uh, bid a lower interest rates for you. So if you were to vote, for example, in November, you would have to not sell your bonds until January. So starting in January, you could, you know, start in it. I know the last time we were looking at numbers with you, it was $10 million. So you know, that is the one limitation on this, is we're assuming bank qualified interest rates. In, in general, I think most, um, financial institutions and the big Wall Street firms see rates coming up by the fourth quarter, but not, you know, not a substantial increase. But um, they, they do expect them to start increasing near the fourth quarter of the year or the first quarter of next year, but, you know, marginally not, not back to where we were. You know, so, Carrie, ago. this would be a private placement, uh, as we discussed during the finance. Right. We are proposing using the same format that the city used in 2012, 2012 uh, for the refinancing. I think it was a building authority issue. 
had uh, fi uh, fire station bonds that we were able to refinance for 1.8 percent interest rates for 10 years. Or it was like actually 11 years we had financed that one for, and so we got a very favorable rate of interest. And uh, now also, what we're doing is we're going to be able to get uh, without having to go for a vote of the people, we'll be able to expedite getting at least an initial funding towards new road funding that we need to do. And then afterwards, then we can discuss as far as potentially going for a vote of the people and uh, look for additional financing, which would happen at the next calendar year. The, uh, the fact that we have Huntington Bank uh, the portfolio, what we're doing with them, is it, uh, uh, is it something that they would go uh, after? Yes. They were one of the aggressive bidders on the uh, last deal. There was, uh, was PNC Bank and Huntington Bank. They were the top two most aggressive banks during the last uh, the last time we went for financing. Would that be part of a deal? Uh, they've expressed an interest. They were at the last council finance meeting, and they had expressed a sincere interest, and they said 10 years would be the ideal time that they would be interested in, and the $10 million number works for them very well. So that is the sweet spot that we were doing. I know that years ago when Parks and Rec, had a bond and, and he put the weight on Southfield Bank to bid and they forgot to turn in their bid and they went in and just did the zip code 48075 and they won it. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, I just was, was wondering because the Wall Street Journal was talking about states and municipalities, local governments uh, who are hard pressed for dollars right now. They're being scrutinized a little heavier. And I possible fall out over the Detroit bankruptcy too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that actually helps you because you have such a good credit rating that the municipalities that, that are being the most harmed by that are the <coughs> lower rated municipalities. And we're not talking about going out because just like in 2012 we don't have to get a rating when it's a direct placement. But you know, these institutions know that they can go and look up your rating and, you know, know what that is. So you're going to get the benefit of them knowing what your credit is. Good Mr. Uh, yes. Mr. Land. Yeah. Uh, Fred answered uh, some of the questions that I was going to ask. Uh, Fred, when is the next fiscal year? The, the, the next fiscal year, uh, we start July 1.
we haven't seen too much discussion on that. It, it but was the overall taking away is, is still out there. I think it's going to be taken away from other type of, of entities first. Okay. Um, so the bonds that we're talking about there wouldn't fall into that category because we're talking about private sale. I'm going to give. I'm going to have Steve come up and. Pleasure. <coughs> Also, what Terry was mentioning uh, was the Build America bonds. Build America bonds were where they were taxable bonds, and the reimbursement was given back to municipalities. Unfortunately, municipalities got cut back on their reimbursement from the federal government, so, and okay. so that's where the negative Same experience. Same thing the states do. Stephen Frank with Miller Canfield. Um, thank you, and just to echo what Terry has said, there have been proposals that have been floated. There are currently some out there. Uh, that would alter uh, the availability of the tax exemption for municipal bonds generally. Um, there have not been any proposals that I'm aware of, at least serious proposals, that would eliminate the exemption completely. Um, but there are some that would reduce the value of the exemption, basically. So it would still be there, uh, but in a somewhat lesser form, meaning that the cost of municipalities would be slightly higher. Yeah. Uh, not as high as if you had to go out and borrow at the higher taxable rates. Um, so there's a little bit of a compromise there. Um, whether that will pass or not, I don't think uh, anybody thinks that those proposals got serious traction, um, not in the current federal system leader, I don't think at this point. Um, but that certainly is, is a possibility in the future that could be impacted. But as it stands right now, um, the exemption is as it has been. Uh, it's available. And uh, once the bonds are issued as fixed rate bonds, the nice protection for the city is those changes in tax law don't affect the city. They may affect the investors that hold the bonds that um, you know, now have less value uh, in terms of the interest income they receive. But once they're issued by the city uh, as fixed rate bonds, you're, you're locked in under current laws. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you think we have your business uh, Certainly. Yes. 150 West Jefferson Avenue, Suite 2500, and that's in Detroit. <coughs> Four eight two two six. Thank you. Uh, if there's not any more questions, then we'll move it as well uh, to our regular meeting. I, I just want to comment. Uh, you just look at this plant next year. This involves twenty-seven and a half million dollars of investment. This is a very aggressive investment on our uh, part. Um, that twenty-seven million dollars. If you uh, drive through, you can already see the work being done by the utility companies in advance of our work. And this is just roads. Later on, we'll be talking about Section 31. You drive through, jet down, Shiawassee, the utility companies are all through there in advance of our work. I've been trying to get a handle on, I'm willing to bet that maybe another four and a half, five million has been invested in utilities in advance of us. So we're talking a $27 million investment in our community and our roads. That <coughs> message for a first run community is just so critical for economic development efforts to communicate that we're going to you know, rebuild these 40, 50 year old roads and position them for the next 50, 60 years. And, um, I think the council needs to be commended. Um, in my five years here, this is one of our largest years in roads. And you know, the work that's been done the last few years and a lot of it, the discussion about the IRA, a lot of these projects were identified in your submittals back in February 2009 to the feds and where you advanced the money for engineering <coughs> and they're now coming. It's a shame that it takes so long for these things to happen, but the road building process is about a six to seven year process and though that work in 2009 is now bearing fruit. Uh, I think our business community is really excited about it. Uh, <coughs> I don't have any questions on the bond. I'm fine with that. But uh, as long as we have a couple minutes, I was going to bring this up under the consent agenda. Well, Mayor Lawrence, I believe, has a question. Well, I, I have a question on this. Oh. Um, but I was going to wait till later, but since we have time now. Uh, Fred, you know, we, we've talked about um, uh, it being a million dollars to do a mile of road. And here we're doing half of Evergreen Road, uh, or Greenfield Road, and it's, it's, the project cost is $3 million. And I don't understand why the county road and our share of that is higher than the county's share. Um, the county is, is supposed to pay 442000 
city of Southfield, 580,000. Um, it just seems out of whack to me. Now, I, don't, I don't know if, uh, okay. if you can answer that now, but um, well, it, part of it is that are we layered water and sewer in Greenfield, in particular the water mains? There are a number of businesses that um, don't have direct meters and are sub metered off of Northland. And we're using this as an opportunity to address the water main issue along Greenfield. And you know, that's where you'll see the water and sewer right. numbers uh, 481. So we're only paying 52000 then? For roads. So the, when we're done with this project, the road department, major roads, will only be charged 62000 Okay. The water and sewer, they have a 481,000. They have 100% of that cost because it's an add on in yeah. the budget. But, and I will, that is a sorely, this year alone I've had two Saturday calls where the water main broke at Northland and the plasma center and Wendy's are without water. And we've got people over there trying to make sure Wendy's can flip burgers. So, so. All right, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Well, I, uh, uh, is there any yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to just just make this part of the record. Um, we must be really clear and deliberate in inspection during this construction process. And you know, we had that, I think it was Inkster Road where everyone was pointing fingers at everyone else. I want to clear whose responsibility is it to be there to inspect these roads if it are architects, city and whoever it is is part of the cost of it because I'm, to me that piece of it is we want these roads to last the expected time. So I just want to be real clear on that because that was not a good feeling. On May 5th, that's the session we are leading in with our roads about the process and the quality controls in the road construction process. And we've gone through a lot of legal departments to be commended for the wrangling over getting the contracts that our engineers can shut these jobs down now. Okay. Uh, but that's a we are starting the road conversation off with process and quality control. Okay. Uh, who was that? Sure. Who, who does the quality control? Well, the, uh, the, the quality actually. control is primarily defined by our, our contract with the feds, uh, and that's the process that's going to be reviewed. But we are adding certain elements. For example, asphalt is now being inspected at the plant because one of the things we can't inspect it when it's out in the field. You, Mr. Councilman Picasso has been saying for that. So you'll hear that piece. Concrete, they're out in the plant as well. But we making sure that the asphalt, uh, the concrete doesn't sit in the trucks out there, that the temperatures are right, they have daily logs when it can't be too hot, it can't be too cold. But you're going to hear about a 20-minute presentation, and this is a joint effort uh, by both HRC and o OHM to make this presentation. Lee Schultz will be leading the initial conversation, and then she'll turn it off to our two, to our <coughs> two larger uh, engineering firms. Last many, many years, no, not, not many years ago, years ago, it was HRC who did the inspection of the roads. And they, one guy was here and he said, well, we drilled a hole in the, in the new road and then we up the, the no. coral thing and we looked at it there, it was perfect. It wasn't. They lied to us. So, if we did again another thing like that, <laughs> irresponsible people to yeah. inspect for us. I, I think we've tightened this contract up that they could shut a job down. Um, I, I think this is why when the administration was looking at this, we wanted everyone to fully understand the, the measures involved in making sure that whether it's an asphalt road or a concrete road, that we're getting the best safeguards. Uh, the city can always buy an additional warranties, but I've seen some of the preliminary costs for buying additional warranties, and they're pretty prohibitive. That will be discussed as well. That's another question. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I, must, I must say that. No, Mayor Lawrence had the floor and then we'll come back to you. Oh. My question was, it wasn't answered. Okay, let's go to Mr. Pekoski. <coughs> I wasn't going to bring this up uh, at all. I was trying to get together a few for that. I just didn't have time the day to call you. I have the same concern that that uh, 
that Jen has, and uh, I went through some figures here. I just couldn't figure out the, the letter that we have before us. I mean, we got, the, we got the county board of commissioners, 162,000, the road commission, open county four and forty two, six hundred four thousand dollars, and we're over here at five hundred eighty thousand, um, and and then we hit for three hundred thousand for design and construction. I I didn't know what the heck that. Uh, 580 was, unless it was the sewer. Um, well, the sewer, a sewer is 481,000, water and sewer. And then you had the 62. Then they had the LERF was 62,000. Then 100,000 comes from DDA, comes 643,000 if you add it all together. And and these guys have come up with 604. And, and I'm just saying is that it's their road, but it's our water main. No, uh, no, no, I, no, I understand that, So I'm just saying is that, that if, if we are reconstructing something that is, it should be the water sewer, I think, should have been separate from the construction that, in other words, the county has to come back and fix the road that they did not fix property, construct property. If we repair that road, is X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. If we have other work to do in that right away, then that is something else. But I wanted to make sure that that the county wasn't going to jab us. I mean, my attitude was give them nothing. I mean, that was my attitude. I mean, that's their road. And I look at 12 Marlboro, they don't even put coal pack in the holes. There's one over there where the bus stop is and you come out of Myers, you lose a truck. You know, and they're doing nothing on 12 mile road at all. And and I think I think they've really I, I think that the county uh, and the state, you know, have um, have really messed Southfield up in, as far as what they do uh, in the city. Um, you know, you go under the bridge, go northbound on a Telegraph Road on the East Ridley Lane under the bridge. It's all gone. Asphalt's gone. And, and then three quarters of the lane before your first cut is it's cracked all the way down to the first street when you turn around to come back onto <coughs> Lebanon Mile in front of Toys R Us in, on, on Telegraph Road. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is only five years old. They screwed up our median. They cut our water. They did a poor job on asphalt. Everybody else got concrete and curbs and all this other stuff. And we get crap. Excuse the language. And 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 then you know, and we got roads in our city, local roads that need work. How you got to stick money down here because it's their roads, and the traffic's here, the volume is here, and they've got to put this money here. You know, and then, uh, then they're real short. You know, I don't know how we are in the state, but I came through, you know, from the south this last week. Do you know that in Florida? They have bridges that even have planters all the way across. Planters. I mean, all brick, nice uh, uh, bridges. I mean, not just poured concrete. I mean, I look at this. I couldn't stop because you know, but I wanted to stop and show what they're doing. They come and then they got they got these winding turnabouts that that go on around four around all over around Tampa there, and and. And all the roads are under construction, everything being wide. You go through Ohio, the same thing. You get, they got bridges going up. They're all <coughs> different kind of construction. They're fancy. And, and I'm saying, how do they, and then they're putting all the roads in Ohio. How in the world do these people get this money and we get snookered where we don't get the money to do anything? And we got bridges falling down. We got roads that you come in from Ohio into Michigan. And you say, welcome to Michigan, pure Michigan. Yeah, pure whatever. But I did a whole workout on that. Can I, they say, I, just, I just got sick about it. I said, even though they, they did came in, I guess, last year, they were talking about $8 million, as well as, uh, no, $2,934,268. They, they, uh, I, mean, I just, I just, it became a very parochial. And, and saying, you know, I'm going to take care of us first, and, and they're not going to give me asphalt, give everybody else concrete, 
you know, they're going to give me everything that, and more than they give the others. Because really, I don't know, we've we got to redo Telegraph Road already. I mean, there's a hole. Under the bridge, there's actually a hole. Down at Nine Mile and uh, uh, Telegraph, too. Yeah. And Grant and Swanson. Swanson and Telegraph. It's all come out. There's a big hole there. Yeah, I yeah, know uh, when you turn off the little the acceleration, yeah, you America. lose a truck in there. Yeah. Anyways, I, I thank you, Mayor Chair. I'm doing the first time you forgot last year. They did the same thing. Remember that? Okay. Uh, question on the when the when the contractors put down their bonds to uh, make make certain that they're doing good work. I remember contractor who worked in the uh, subdivision of Red Leaf in that area, within a month the, the, the roads were standing up. My question done goes to them. And I said, how much bond did they put down to fix it? He said, oh, we gave it back to them. The bonds were given back less than two months. Do we have a time where we keep the bonds until, until the roads are proved that they're good? We take generally on our roads, on our projects, a two year maintenance and guarantee period. After the two years. They they have to buy a bond to guarantee the condition of the road for two years. I know, I know and I know earlier there, there initially there was a, a one year. So I don't know in recent history they've gone to two years. And I don't want to talk about it because I know. And we also hold retainage as well. Huh? We hold retainage till we till all the punch list is, is, is completed. Yeah, so how much time now? Two years. Two Once years. we accept the road, there should be in place. What's the oversight on that? Who 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 has the oversight on the bonds when they're doing that road? When they're not doing that, is it ever with the problem? Depends upon who. Depends upon whose road it is. If it's telegraph, it's the state. If it's uh, no, I'm the road, road, it road. happened in our city. In our subdivisions. Well, in our subdivision, that's mostly ours. Yeah. I, I, I would be. So when on the fifth, you're going to see the roads that are eligible for federal aid. Major, major local roads. You're gonna, a graph will come up. We'll have maps here. You'll see how few roads. How, uh, I forget the number of miles. We had 246 miles of road. And a very small number of those roads are eligible for federal aid, which means the majority of the roads are ours. If you're in front of a residential neighborhood, it's most likely our road. All right, it's all road, but I'm asking what the, how the, what's the time limit? Well, right, they, right now, we're, 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 we under the contract, we have a two-year maintenance and guarantee bond. So that means contract. for a period, right? For a, they buy that bond. We're given that bond at the time the contract is entered into. Who who has the oversight to see they don't get back the money until the, until the contract is over? I would say someone in the city. city. Inspection, right? We should be inspecting that when we get it. right? It would be our consulting engineer. We've changed their contracts that they can shut these jobs down. Two years ago, they could. Maybe it's three years ago they could. Uh, <coughs> I don't like to see it happen again. That's I think we, we all feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have a full workout on May the 5th. Fifth. Fifth. Yeah. Yeah. Quality control and process engineering is there. The council would like us to buy a longer warranty. I, based on this conversation, I'll go back and ask them to be prepared to discuss what those numbers may look like. On our projects, we currently go with two years. That's the first I heard of it. I know, I know money was given back before that. You see, on a bond, you don't give money well, back. Whatever it is. Okay. The, uh, the that, might be a that might be a retainage. They might have retainage. reduced the retainage yeah. prior to the road really being inspected yeah. and accepted. That's all the retainer now. Well, those are two different things. The retainage is what amount you hold back from paying the contractor until you do a final inspection of the road. That's okay. by statute. So that money was given. That out. could have been. That's wholly different than the bond. But well, I don't yeah. mean the correct. It shouldn't have been. I mean, if we didn't inspect the road and know that it met the specs, it shouldn't have been the, re the retainage. That's what. 
That's what you hold as levers to get the contractor to come back out yeah, and address. Yeah, we know that. But right. It didn't happen. I what yeah. is going to happen now? Are we going to know? Do we have somebody who has the open site on that? The answer is yes. And that's okay. our, consul our consulting engineering firms, whether on these that's projects. That's what I'm driving at. They said yes. Well, it's still in conjunction with us. We have the final say. We're signing the document. So I would say that our engineering department would work with the outside consultants okay. to make sure that... Remember, it's in the minutes. You're writing it, right? Absolutely. All right. Just see more. Well, here, I'll check it out. I just mentioned the thing that I wanted to discuss on quality control, not just of the, of the work, but quality control of the materials at the source, and we haven't done that in the past. That's right? too. That's huge. I mean, that's really huge. So there's consistency, and we have and no other one that we're able to, to document and to verify that we really don't know what we've been getting, and we'd be, we'd be paying a heavy cost, price for not knowing. I picked up pieces of that in this one. Okay? I was, well, I knew was something was happening. I can pick up and make sure about that. A few years ago, I was watching a TV program on how do they do that, and one of the things that really surprised me is at the uh, asphalt factory, the, they can switch the mix <laughs> by pushing a button, yeah. and it mm. uh, looks the same coming out of the end of the chute, but, never know. but yeah. Yeah, the operator can push it. A button to whatever has problem with whatever mix they want. So that's why it's important to have somebody that knows their business uh, catch the stuff at the end of the shoot to find out what we're getting. Mm -hmm. I remember the guy coming to us and said he drilled the hole and took out the piece of and it was good. He lied to us.
this type of rope lighting and similar type lighting and lighting up their building. So we've seen examples of it, you know, following the, the roof line, following different, going around the door, going around windows, almost like Christmas lights, actuate, accentuating all the different architectural features of, of a building. Um, right now there are no standards for this, and so the concern is that that may not be the most um, productive and aesthetically pleasing and uh, appropriate way to provide lighting on a building if, if the intent is just to light it up like a Christmas tree, that, you know, from a city standpoint, that there ought to be some standards that they need to meet. Uh, particularly as, you know, how much can they do? Can they pretty much cover every every inch of the building with that? It certainly would make their building visible, but I'm not sure that it's something that would be uh, pleasing aesthetically to the city. So uh, a, a couple of these have kind of made preliminary inquiries. Um, in a couple buildings, apparently the um, Marvin Gardens already has a little bit of it. Uh, Red Roof is maybe interested, and so we're thinking this thing could kind of get some pretty uh, good feet and move fast. So what we'd like to do, and I have it on the uh, regular meeting this evening at the 7 o'clock, is to put a moratorium in place. We'll start doing some research. The planning department has already started to look at it. Uh, come up with some standards and some guidelines about the use of this type of lighting and bring those back over to the planning commission, bring them back to council within that 180 days and be ready to, to establish something that there would be some kind of, something in effect to address. No, because we have a 7 o'clock meeting, so it would be on there, it'd be on there. I just won't bring the the uh, visual aid back at the 7 o'clock, but that's, that's what, and then in the daytime, you know, you, you see that all around all the other gas stations are doing it. Are they? So we just want to kind of get a handle on it before it gets yeah, too far. Right. So it's a little different. But do, you, do you have an example? Well, I, I, I agree. I, there's a there's a liquor store that, and I think Miss Jordan has meant, has mentioned it. There's a liquor store that's at 10 Mile Southfield Road with all the signs in the window and has that light, and it looks wow. so bad. But I hope that in this discussion, Jeff, this is a, I was in San Francisco a few years ago, and this is the outline of the city's, you know, skyline. I think if we can include some of that, you know, obviously a very different discussion, but if buildings in Southfield wanted to do that in our skyline, I think that would be pretty ideal. Right, I think that ideal. it's tastefully done, yeah. and it can look really attractive, and it can really bring something, but yeah. if you do it more like... I absolutely right. agree. So, so that's the, if we study it in... That's San Oh, and we're talking about neon too because neon. Um, yep. For instance, there's that limousine place on Telegraph that is done every in bright pink. Mm -hmm. It's garish. Right. Yeah. It, it can't. Yeah. If you overdo it, it's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. It's not. It's not aesthetically <coughs> pleasing. No. So, so we we figure with the moratorium we can research it and come up with standards and we'll be ready to bring something back to council. Okay. So this will be on our agenda. We agree. I mean, it actually, when we were discussing it, we it kind of engendered that discussion of how long should Christmas lights be able to stay out before or after. A lot of cities regulate that, so we kind of moved naturally in that and we brought it so fast. Well, when the winter ends, you know, in the middle of April, the people problem. keep their Christmas That's lights up. The, the, the building with the credit union and, and Lake of Village, and that beautiful mm -hmm. Yeah. and what they've done in... Um, Rochester, yeah, what they do that for the holiday week. Right, but some places, I mean, like if they don't want to extend that, you know, it becomes garish. You know, I was just recently in, I think I've been a few years I was just recently in the D.C., and they have glass art, and at night it's illuminated with these lights, and it's, it's beautiful. And the art is in any major structure. But it's in the it's in the sidewalk in a public space <coughs> and it's the light. Do they change? The lights change? <coughs> change color well, or the one I, I saw a green one, I saw a blue one. They didn't change. They okay. just moved. Okay. And so uh, anything else? Yeah. Um I would like to uh <coughs> add something to tonight's agenda under presentation. We were notified, I sent him bring an email, we were notified last week that we have a one in five chance now. Um, Mr. Frazier brought up the um, State Farm Insurance Community Assist Program. Uh, in the name of the city of Southfield, I applied. Uh, they accepted 5,000 um, uh, grants and or applications to come.
cut it off. Uh, we were notified just last week that we're in the top 200. So you're only, you're only going to get people can only vote on 200 of, out of the 5,000. And uh, last year the winners only had to have 60,000 votes or so, and they won. And it's done through Facebook, and you get to vote. Um, uh, you know, I, I plan to vote every day, and it's 20 days, so I could cast 200 votes. Ten, ten, you know, ten votes a day. Ten votes a day. So I'd like to mention that at the beginning of the meeting, after the, as a third presentation, uh, to encourage people, Lisa Hawkins said she'd put something up on the, um, the screen with the, the access. But this is um, this is a big deal, and it's and it's for public art. <coughs> yeah, it would be a grant from all state insurance or state farm insurance rather. Uh, uh, Twenty-five thousand dollars. Right. Yeah, and that's, I'm going to actually make a presentation on the presentation as well because uh, my daughter was one of two designers selected. I don't know if Yeah. Uh -huh. 
empty parking at Northland, we have empty parking at these lots. Is there a way that they could like develop a training, simula simulated training, so that uh, senior citizens? Yeah. For a lot of people, yeah. younger yeah. people too. That's not going to happen. Yeah.